welcome to tonight's episode of Rural Doctors. I'm Jerry Gannon. Thanks for your company once again. Tonight, our program will focus on hematology. We'll visit hematologist Dr. Ram Tampi from Clinipath in Perth to find out how to safely administer an iron infusion. We'll also have a chat with Dr. Rosalind Francis from Sir Charles Gardner Hospital about PET scans. We'll find out what they are, what they do, and how they differ from other scans. But to begin with, let's join Olga Ward as she chats with Dr. David Josky, Head of Hematology at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. David, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure. David, a lot of our patients turn up either claiming to be or actually are chronically anaemic. And when do we worry about them? For a start, I would say that um, transfusion, if we're going to be technical, is indicated for um, a life-threatening uh, oxygen carrying deficiency of the blood. So just because somebody's got a low haemoglobin doesn't necessarily mean that they need to be transfused. Um, anemia is best regarded as a symptom rather than a diagnosis. In other words, you need to find a cause for it. And mm -hmm. traditionally, in the workup of patients with anemia, we split it into microcytic, macrocytic and all the rest. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually very useful and pretty robust. So. The first thing that I'll be asking when somebody calls me is what's the mean cell volume? Um, if it's less than 80, then we're thinking about iron deficiency, thalassemias, um, haemoglobinopathies. About a quarter of patients with so-called anemia of chronic disease, uh, which is a misnomer, it can come on within two weeks of acute illness. Yep. But a quarter of those patients will be, iron, uh, will be microcytic as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the fourth one on the list really for the kind of A student registrar is lead poisoning, um, which we've seen about three or four times over the last ten years in my department. So they might, might be seeing that in Esperance, of course. Yeah, well, we see it in, we've seen it a couple of times in Sparky's chewing the uh, wire on oh, um, electric cables because that's got a bit of lead in as the softening agent. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one group, and so the investigation of those is basically iron studies and haemoglobin electrophoresis and the appropriate studies. Mm -hmm. At the, on the other side, the macrocytic ones, um, pregnancy causes macrocytosis. Any brisk marrow response to injury will cause a macrocytosis because reticulocytes or baby red cells are bigger than mature ones. So that you're might take the You're talking about fractures or you're talking about actual... No, no, I'm talking about an insult to the bone marrow like an alcoholic binge or a dose of chemo or something like that. Uh -huh. um, other causes... Myeloma seems to cause a rise in the mean cell volume for reasons that we don't know. Alcohol is probably the commonest cause of a mm. macrocytosis. Do they have to um, be like a chronic alcoholic to, uh, to produce a macrocytosis? Yes. Or this isn't somebody that's having a couple of beers after work every day kind of alcohol? No, we, we talk about um, <coughs> the rottenness binge syndrome uh, and the commonest manifestation in that kind of setting is actually thrombocytopenia mm -hmm. rather than macrocytic anemia. Most alcoholics end up with a multifactorial anemia between the alcohol and its effect on the bone marrow, uh, B12 and iron deficiency, and iron deficiency might be compounded by blood loss from varices and so on. Uh, nutritional deficiencies, because they're not eating uh, good foods. Um, there's about six different ways, if you sit down and look at it, how an alcoholic might become anemic. And then the, the so-called normocytic anemias, where the mean cell volumes are between 80 and 100 femtolitres. Um, the first thing to do is to get somebody to look at the blood film. Yeah. There's, there's about four sets of red cell changes that are diagnostic, um, including um, spherocytes indicating an immune-mediated anemia, that is hemolytic anemia. Mm -hmm. uh, helmet cells, which are like, think of an American GI, yeah. red cell sort of cut in half indicating microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, and you see that with things like nephritis and hypertension, hemolytic uremic syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so when I'm reporting on a patient with a newly diagnosed anemia in my capacity as a pathologist for Path West, um, my comment often reads something like normocytic anemia without specific diagnostic features seen. And the first step we'd usually then say is check the hematinics, check B12, folate 9, yep. because you might have a sort of multiple deficiency and so the red cell size averages out back in the middle again. Mm -hmm. And if you still haven't found a cause and if the anemia seems to be worsening, then that's probably the time to consider a referral to a hematologist 
uh, in the elderly, then we're starting to think about possible myelodysplastic syndrome and need for a bone marrow biopsy. Yeah. And there seem to be quite a lot of very resistant iron deficiency patients around. Even patients who, like, don't have celiac disease and patients who are either male or whose periods are definitely under control after you ask. Um, how do you go fishing to find something as a I think this is very real. And I've been referred a lot of patients over the years mm. where there's true iron deficiency anemia. There's no cause for blood loss. There's no documented blood loss. Uh, iron replacement in the diet or uh, otherwise is adequate mm. and yet they're still recurringly iron deficient. Yeah. Um, and I've been sort of thinking in my brain for five or ten years that there must be some syndrome we're missing. And I got very excited uh, to see something in the literature about 18 months ago in Nature, uh, a newly s described genetic change which appears to affect iron absorption. Unfortunately, that entity, whilst it's real, is probably incredibly rare. Mm -hmm. uh, so my meat-eating farmers uh, haven't all got some rare genetic disease then? Uh, look, I think this is very real, as I said, and there seem to be quite a substantial population of people who have recurring iron deficiency despite adequate iron replacement and no obvious iron loss. Mm -hmm. So I think we're all behoven to check out for a cause of iron loss. Um, the, the studies show in people over the age of 60, you're highly likely to find a malignancy. In people under the age of 60, um, in women, it's usually a combination of diet plus loss through menses and childbirth. So women will lose about 20% of their iron stores with each child. Um, and so they often, after two or three kids, get into a pretty mm -hmm. parlous position with iron balance already. Um, it's hard to say how far to investigate it. Do you go all the way to pan endoscopy? Um, probably you need to, particularly in the elderly, mm -hmm. in the younger patients, possibly not, and just do the faecal occult bloods. If you still haven't found a cause and you've been through the diet, you've been through possible uh, genitourinary blood loss and no gastrointestinal blood loss, um, then I think you're left with one of these people that can't yep. absorb iron and needs to get it some other way. Mm. How do you squeeze iron into vegetarian diets? It looks like there are iron promoters and inhibitors that should be taken alongside the well-known rich sources of non-animal iron. Mm -hmm. um, so spinach and broccoli are the classic, the dark green vegetables. Yeah. Uh, it turns out, for example, that spinach, which everyone thinks of as a great source of iron, you know, hence the mythology and the Popeye ads, um, spinach has a lot of oxalates in which inhibit iron absorption. Uh, so if you want to get the most out of spinach in terms of iron absorption, then you should have it with tomato, uh, because tomato is one of these iron promoters which puts iron into a um, reduced form and so it's better absorbed. Um, and there's a few websites around with this information on it about which are iron inhibitors and which are iron promoters. It can still be hard for a vegetarian to get enough iron in the diet. Mm. Um, most should b respond to uh, oral iron supplements mm. and there are tricks to prescribing uh, oral iron that will improve compliance uh, in my experience. Well I think you've got to warn patients when they start iron um, they're going to get a lot of wind, top end and bottom end. Uh, I believe the reason is that when you're iron deficient the bugs, the bowel flora are iron deficient as well so you take some iron and they grow like bilio so lots of gas produced and hence very antisocial wind at both ends. You can probably reduce that by taking live culture yogurts at the same time as starting iron. Mm -hmm. um, in the big studies that have been done, about 80% of people should be able to tolerate oral iron. Yeah, most of them con complain of either constipation or diarrhoea and it seems to cause equal quantities of both. Mm, it's very real and I've had, I've had one patient require laparotomy for iron-induced bowel obstruction. Uh, it used to be called pseudo-bowel obstruction, but um, hers was probably real. Um, and there are genuinely probably about 10% of people whose GI tracts just cannot tolerate mm. the extra iron. Do those um, oral preparations that sort of taste like a rusty nail in sugar water, so they're uh, syrups, are they any easier for the patients to take or do they have any less side effects? Well, the Fergon elixir is the best 
I think, oral iron mm -hmm. supplement there is. But it's only a 90 ml bottle and you should have 15 mils a day. So, you know, it's about a bottle a week if you're taking it properly and it becomes very expensive very quickly. Um, FGF has got about 100 milligrams of iron, whereas Ferrograd C has got about 300 milligrams of iron. Uh, so Ferrograd C is a much better source of the one I usually prescribe. Mm -hmm. And as I say, most people I find tolerate it, but one or two in ten can't. Yeah. And those people I'd suggest either take it with food when you won't absorb as much, but you might still get some, or scale back to uh, FGF uh, or the Fergon Elixir, or take a tablet every second day. Yeah. See how that goes. Now you mentioned thalassemia, and I've always found thalassemia very confusing. Can you just run us through thalassemia? <laughs> Well, the hallmark of thalassemia is microcytosis. Mm -hmm. um, in thalassemia tray, you'll have a near normal haemoglobin, but a mean cell volume that's characteristically 70 or less. Yeah. Um, the, the two big issues for people with thalassemia tray are firstly that a lot of them are treated and misdiagnosed as iron deficiency for years and erroneously and unnecessarily given iron. And the second issue is that people with thalassemia tray who partner somebody else with thalassemia tray uh, are putting themselves at risk of having a child with a full-blown thalassemia syndrome, mm -hmm. which should be very avoidable in this day and age. So it's an important diagnosis to make, at least for those two reasons. Um, we can split hairs and say that thalassemia is underproduction of a globogen, whereas the haemoglobinopathies like sickle cell anemia are production of an abnormal haemoglobin alpha or beta chain. Yep. Um, so within the thalassemias, alpha or beta thalassemia, again referring to underproduction of one or either of those chains. Yep. Um, and uh, as I said, I'm pleased to say that in this state we've got really good workup so that whereas before we'd often have to assume, for example, alpha thal thalassemia tray, which is the hardest to pick on the standard workup, we can now do the molecular analysis and pin about 80 or 90 percent of cases and say with certainty the DNA study confirms that you've got alpha thalassemia trait. So if you wanted to work that up, what do you actually write on the request form? Just haemoglobin electrophoresis and haemoglobin studies. Mm -hmm. And the lab will go on and do the DNA test that we need to do with that sample. And yeah. what are the racial groups, can you remind me, that we need to look at? It's changing. Um, Ten years ago when I was head of the laboratory in Path West, um, our biggest um, haemoglobin disorders were beta thalassemia tray um, and to a lesser extent haemoglobin E which is a pretty benign entity um, from Southeast Asia. In the last five years the influx and the proportion has grown increasingly from East and West Africa and so we're starting to get sickle cell tray um, mm -hmm. and sickle cell anemia. So PMH have got about eight kids now I think with sickle cell anemia. So our registrars are going to have to learn how to look after that. Uh, in the years to come. When we first started talking, you were talking about people being anemic and requiring transfusion. Now, obviously, in an acute situation, um, that would be the case. Sometimes country GPs will get a patient who'll come back, say, post-operatively or after trauma that's been treated in the city and they're transferred for um, ongoing care yep. back to their rural or regional area. Um, and they're often quite anemic. You know, like they might have a haemoglobin of, of 80 or 90, um, would you want to be transfusing them up? If they're asymptomatic, no. The normal bone marrow will recover by 10 grams per litre per week. Mm -hmm. So you go from a haemoglobin of 70 or 80 to 80 or 90 each week as, yep. it, as it recovers quickly. The elderly and people with inflammation, a bit slower. Um, but if, if the cause that made the haemoglobin drop is now removed, then, and they're not symptomatic, Mm -hmm. then it's actually a good policy just to be patient and let it come up. Encourage a good diet. You can check the iron and yeah. um, B12 folate levels and if they're low, top them up one way or another. Um, it's very easy and safe to give folate supplements to people who are recovering, uh, for example, from surgery. Um, and if it's not coming up, um, then that's a separate problem. And if people are symptomatic yeah. in terms of, for example, angina, Yep. then obviously they need a transfusion. Yeah, so our little, old, uh, our little old people who've had a, a hip replacement or something and they're quite short of breath and they're pretty pale and they're a bit puffy, you would then recommend maybe transfusing them up? Yes, Just I one would. or two units very slowly? 
I would usually give a dose of frusamide if I'm giving two or more units to somebody over a certain age. Yeah. Um, the the Joski formula uh, for the dose is age plus creatinine divided by two, as as a rough rule of thumb. Yeah. Um, and um, about three hours per bag. So if you've got to give three units, it's too long for a day case. Yeah. Uh, would be our policy. And if you try and rush it through quicker, it often backfires. Oh, I think most most country patients would be impatient if they were going to be um, transfused in any mm. case. Sadly, I think the commonest reason patients are transfused in the teaching hospitals is so that they can either have their procedure quicker, mm. if, if they've been seen in with iron deficiency anemia and they need an endoscopy, or to get them out of hospital quicker. Yeah. Uh, which in some ways is justifiable because the hospital bed's up to $2,000 a day. But um, I think that pressure um, doesn't always correspond to the clinical indication for transfusion. Mm. Um, in my chronically transfusion-dependent patients, that's a bit of a different situation. And uh, most... These are people with some kind of bone marrow failure or myelofibrosis yeah. or something? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in those patients, I think a lot of them are under-transfused, actually, and mm -hmm. we tend to say, well, we'll give you a top-up every time your haemoglobin gets down to 80, which leaves them often symptomatic between 80 and 100. Um, and there is some evidence that the very elderly can be symptomatic below about 110. Could we just talk about something absolutely different? Kids sometimes present with a single swollen, painless lymph node, often in the neck. How would you investigate that? Okay, well, that's, I'm the wrong person to ask in a sense because I see a lot of patients where, for one reason or another, lymphadenopathy has been left in an adult for a long time yep. and, and lymphoma diagnosis delayed. So my rule of thumb in an adult is if it's still there after a four or six weeks and yep. there's no explanation, consider getting um, further investigation done. Yeah, and do you actually take it out or is a fine needle enough? Fine needle is worth doing mm -hmm. um, as a kind of preliminary screening test but won't give it an exact answer. So if you're suspicious of lymphoma, fine needle is only about 80% accurate for B cell lymphomas yeah. because we can do the flow cytometry and that's a good test for picking yeah. up a small number of abnormal B cells. But it's only about 20% accurate for Hodgkin's where the tumour cells are only about 3% of the lump. Mm -hmm. um, and Hodgkin's of course more common in kids, so you, yep. would, you, would you be inclined to take the note out, do you think? It's the only way to get a definitive answer. And you can't go biopsying everyone on the planet. But uh, And so I appreciate this is probably a lot harder for a GP than for me. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time I'm referred people where it's already obvious that the lymphadenopathy is pathological. But not always. Yeah. And, and so where, for example, there's a small single node in an adult who's otherwise well and it's been there for two months, um, one of the things that I've occasionally done is to do a PET scan on spec because if it's PET Being scan, you can, can order almost a scan. differentiate between uh, reactive and malignant. Yeah. Um, and I'll do an FNA because it's a simple thing to do, but in my mind I'm always thinking, well, it's only going to be 80% accurate at best and probably a lot worse for some other sorts of lymphoma. Yeah. So as a country Jeep, we'd probably either take it out or refer? Yeah, I mean, I, I would go through the history for B-type symptoms, uh, weight loss, night sweats, uh, fever, um, itch in the skin. Uh, in lymphomas, as in other malignancies, there's often spontaneous intolerance of cigarettes or meat or alcohol. Um, examine for all of the other lymph node stations, including looking at the tonsils, yep. uh, epitrochlea and popliteal lymph nodes often missed, um, to see if there's any evidence of a more systemic process. Yep. There's no direct blood test for lymphoma. Mm. Uh, we do flow cytometry on the peripheral blood in our hands, uh, and it's a good lab. About 3% of our lymphoma patients show monoclonal B cells in the bloodstream. So it sounds like we're doing some biopsy. Yeah. Doctors Josky and Ward there, and we'll return to that discussion in a moment. One of the main concerns when giving an iron infusion is how to protect the patient against the risk of an allergic reaction and what to do should any difficulties occur. Dr. Ram Tampi from Clinipath spoke to us about some things you should be aware of and how to prepare your patients for an infusion. 
Ram, welcome to the program. Hello. Ram, a large number of patients are really quite intolerant of oral iron preparations, even the liquid ones. Is an infusion appropriate for all of them? I think where the patients had um, a repeated causes of, of oral iron uh, and or liquid preparations and they've uh, either become intolerant or they're continuing to be symptomatic and they're starting to become anemic then I think there's a definite place for iron, iron infusion. I'm just going to take your blood pressure. Are you ready for your iron infusion today? Yes. Yep. Okay, just pop your hand down there. Could you outline the sort of investigations that we should do before organising an iron infusion? A kind of baseline raft of things that you look for that, that might be preventable or reversible causes? I, I think starting with the, the patient's clinical history, um, one is able to obtain some information uh, which leads you to do, provide the uh, appropriate investigations. However, we do some blanket screening. That's uh, because we tend to see a large number of patients with menorrhagic iron deficiency. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just to be on the safe side and make sure there isn't any other cause, we firstly screen them for celiac disease, uh, then H. pylori, um, which can cause gastritis and of course mm -hmm. uh, malabsorption of iron, and also uh, von Willebrand's um, screening as well. Uh, we estimate that about um, between 5 and 10 percent of our patient population tends to have this condition. If you just write um, a COAG profile, will that automatically include a von Willebrand factor or do you have to specifically ask for it? You need to specifically ask for von Willebrand's factor because the COAG profile will only include the APTT component. Additionally, uh, two, th two other things are important, and that is to um, ask for platelet function tests uh, as well as a blood group. Um, and the latter is particularly important because in patients with blood group O, uh, the von Willebrand's factor levels tend to be on the lower side and it can be misleading if you see low levels and make a um, false diagnosis of uh, von Willebrand's disease. Those patients with menorrhagia um, who say have von Willebrand's, you then try and correct the menorrhagia um, in other ways. Um, would you still give them the iron infusion? The main thing is to replete the iron stores quickly and once you've done that then you can attend to whatever uh, their uh, deficiency is and in the case of von Willebrand's disease uh, it uh, depends, you could uh, start with a trial of uh, tranexamic acid mm -hmm. and in the worst case scenario then it may be mean giving them um, a DDAVP mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that's extreme cases. There's your um, tell fast, take that. Yep. Okay, now what arm do you want your adrenaline in? Which Don't care? Like the that one? The will be there. So yep, up the there? Top. Okay. Yep. With, with um, anyone who has um, rebus come out in hives and lots of itching, so but depending what it is, we, us we usually give adrenaline and if it's a reaction during an iron infusion, we tend to give um, half a mil, so 0 0.5. So anyone coming, having had a reaction before in a past iron infusion, we tend to give, um, as a rule, two, um, 0 0.25. One in a thousand. Patients sometimes come back to the country after having had a large operation, say a hip replacement or something, and they'll often become quite anemic, particularly if they're not eating very well in the month or two after the operation. Um, it's quite hard sometimes to get hold of blood to give in a very small place. Is it appropriate to give an iron infusion instead or should we actually be looking for blood in those cases? If they are again are symptomatic and they deserve iron and um, iron repletion is a problem then I think uh, uh, it is a simple matter of providing them with an iron infusion uh, but it doesn't stop you from looking for um, uh, additional blood loss. So the patient comes in with, with their eye and they get a script from their referring doctor. We draw up the five um, ampules and we put it into 500 mils of normal saline. What I've set up here is um, a bag of saline which um, I'm now putting that, those ampules of iron into and because um, Reba's had a previous reaction what we like to do here is put up a sideline which is normal saline 
so that we can run both bags in at the same time and therefore dilute uh, what we're giving. This is the bit you don't like, isn't it, Reva? No. <laughs> I'll be very gentle. I know, you're always Yeah, I know. Now, the reason um, why I'm using the um, anticubital fossa is that um, A, the, the veins are nice and big there and the patients that we infuse here are, are usually young, well people who just need to sit for two hours and, um, you know, if um, for obvious reasons, if the patient is, is older or infirmed or whatever and cannot sit still, um, then we would use um, another area of, of the arm that would uh, splint itself, uh, i.e. just on the wrist here, maybe on the back of the hand um, or lo lower down on the forearm. In our demonstration patient that we've just seen have an iron infusion, she was given adrenaline and an oral antihistamine. And I seem to remember giving patients with leukaemia, say, multiple blood transfusions, and we used to give them an intravenous antihistamine and a dose of steroids. Do you ever use steroids, or is that adrenaline antihistamine combination the best? We've uh, selected to use uh, adrenaline in the main um, because it's quite convenient and given subcutaneously, it uh, works very fast. Uh, and we've uh, generally had no problems with that. Uh, occasionally, we do tend to use antihistamines as well. Um, the case for steroids only occurs uh, in, in two instances. Firstly, if that patient has had a very severe previous iron mm -hmm. uh, reaction to the iron infusion, uh, and they've come up either in hives or uh, a, a vasoactive attack, um, mm -hmm. then, then uh, one uh, tends to prime them with prednisolone beforehand and usually we tend to give them 25 milligrams of prednisolone on the day before and 25 milligrams on the day. All right, and you do that rather than just whopping some hydrocortisone down the drip just before they have it? That's right. Yep. Now hospitals are always very nervous about anaphylactic reactions with iron infusions. Um, how common are they, say, compared with antibiotic allergies or whatever? In our hands um, we've discovered that the reaction rate is somewhere between uh, 5 to 8 percent. Mm -hmm. And the large number of these reactions are quite mild. Uh, and it may be uh, just a touch of indigestion or chest discomfort. Uh, sometimes it's uh, hives. Um, but these are easily controlled with the use of uh, subcutaneous adrenaline. This and it's that issue. half a mil of one in a thousand That's right. seems to do the trick. Yes. We run through a sheet to read where we tell the patients what they can expect, um, like they might feel indigestion, they might feel tight in their chest, they might feel itchy, um, they might look at their arm and see a, a wee bite, um, which is usually a hive. And because we've um, only got a small clinic, like I said before, we're in and around all the time. There's three registered nurses that are on all the time. So we're, we're always there on hand and, and we tell them to let us know the minute they feel anything. I got the itchy ears and then down my neck it started getting quite bad lumps and um, I didn't really get the tightness of breath. I didn't feel funny, just that and yeah. yeah. I don't know if they stopped my infusion. You, you're probably too busy itching to, yeah. to, to worry about that but what we usually do is we come in and we will switch off mm. and we'll organise this to, to just be running mm. um, in saline. Once all the, the symptoms are gone, then we um, introduce the iron again at, at the normal rate. And um, it, I've never seen anyone yet that's had to abort because of a re reaction. Are there always those very early signs of the itching and the indigestion and the, the kinds of things, or do some patients just kind of crash and give you a full-blown anaphylaxis? Uh, in the majority of cases, there are telltale signs. Uh, it could be uh, a patch of itchiness that's developing somewhere, mm -hmm. um, or they've uh, started to develop a cough, uh, which they've not had before, and um, this might uh, lead you to suspect that there's angioedema occurring. Um, on other occasions, and very rarely, uh, they may present with hypotension, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that, is, that can occur at any time. Obviously this lady's had a, a mild or a mild to moderate allergic reaction before and it's been safe to give her another 
dose of, uh, of intravenous iron, if they have a really bad anaphylactic reaction, is it still safe to give them another one? In general, we've not had, had any problems uh, with giving repeated dose. Uh, I think in the last 15 years, there's only been a handful of patients where we've had to think about switching to a safer preparation, and that is the iron sucrose preparation. Uh, unfortunately, you can only give 200 milligrams of that. So um, in the main, if you can prime them with steroids beforehand uh, th and also give them adrenaline, then it, uh, it is not an uh, a issue. Would you see this as a suitable sort of um, procedure to do in a country hospital? Oh, I think so. Uh, I think most definitely, I, I think it uh, should be um, uh, quite within the capability of a country G general practitioner to uh, provide this sort of iron infusion. I'll just remind you um, about um, when you go home to take it easy for 48 hours, so no heavy lifting, no strenuous exercise like going to the gym, Pilates, yoga, vacuum cleaning, that's a strenuous, so anything that's really strenuous. And we ask that you don't um, carry your bag, for example, on this, on this side, carry it on the other side when you go out of here. And you might feel um, some, experience some late symptoms, which could be tiredness, aching joints, headaches, abdominal cramps and flu-like symptoms. Okay. They're quite rare, but if, if you do feel them, they're usually self-limiting. Mm -hmm. And we say that you take a couple of Panadol. Okay. And if you're worried at all, there's numbers on here that you can ring us back okay. at any time you want. All right. Thanks. All right. Okay. Yeah. So anything at all okay. you feel any different, yeah. you let us know. All right? Okay. And we'll be in and out all the time. <laughs> Bring you a cup of tea if you want one later. Thanks. All right. And our thanks to Dr. Tampi for that. Also thanks to clinical nurse manager Cindy DeWald for the demonstration. The patient information checklist that Cindy used will be available on the Rural Health West website. Now let's return to our main discussion with Drs. Josky and Ward. David, welcome back. Thank you. Could you give us some guidelines about patients who've had splenectomies for, for various reasons, I guess most commonly ITP? Um, how do we look after them afterwards? Well, I'm going to backtrack and talk about the spleen a bit because I think the spleen is a much misunderstood organ. Yep. Um, Galen, the great anatomist, thought the spleen was the seat of the soul. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about that, but um, at the risk of patronising you, I'll say what I say to my patients about what the spleen does. Yep. Um, the spleen does two things. The first thing is that it's the place in the body where cells that reach their use-by date are taken out of the bloodstream and recycled. And the mechanism for that is accumulation of molecules, mainly immunoglobulin, on the surface of the cells. So in ITP, for example, for whatever reason, the immune system throws up an antibody that cross-reacts with platelets. So mm. suddenly platelets arrive at the spleen coated in antibody. The spleen, in doing its job, takes them out of the circulation but prematurely, and the bone marrow can't keep up. It'll, mm -hmm. it'll increase production six or eightfold, but when it can't keep up, then the patient becomes thrombocytopenic. Yep. The second job of the spleen is that it's a lymph gland for the bloodstream. So again, as I say to my patients, you know, kids have an infection, a sore throat, all the glands come up to stop the infection spreading. Yep. Well, the spleen does that for the bloodstream. So people who are living life without their spleen, and there are several thousand at least in Perth, um, are at increased risk of those particular bugs that get into the bloodstream, the encapsulated organisms, mm -hmm. uh, Neisseria, Strep pneumoniae and Haemophilus. I don't quite know exactly why that's the case, but it, it's, it's certainly true. And the risk of overwhelming sepsis in splenectomised patients uh, historically has been in the order of 1 in 600. Mm -hmm. So um, these days the operation is much easier and simpler and less invasive and patients are generally up and walking by the second post-op day yeah. and a much smaller scar. So, so what they do with the laparoscopic splenectomies is clamp the pedicle, yeah. put a plastic bag around the spleen and mulch it up so it's deformable and pull it out through a much smaller hole. Uh, it's very clever. And, and whereas often we'd like to be able to, if we're doing a diagnostic splenectomy, which is pretty uncommon, yeah. but we might be suspicious, for example, of primary splenic lymphoma, then 
I would be quite prepared to accept getting the spleen in a mulch state for histopathology because we still have enough to look at um, when you think about how much kinder it is to the patient in terms of the scarring mm. and post-operative recovery. After that, well, preoperatively we would vaccinate uh, patients with the three vaccines for the bugs that I mentioned. Ideally more than 72 hours preoperatively if you can. Mm. You obviously can't if it's a traumatic rupture of the spleen or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we'd always do that electively. Postoperatively, uh, patients should be revaccinated according to the schedules. Um, two out of the three need to be repeated at three or so yearly intervals. Yeah. Um, well, the pneumococcal vaccine, they normally recommend five yearly, and of course for the elderly they only recommend two doses, whereas I'm guessing if you've got a young patient with a splenectomy, it's going to be every five years for life. Yeah? Yes. Um, whereas the Neisseria vaccines, they usually give you a primary course and then, you've, then you stop. But we would use a different meningococcal vaccine for that, wouldn't we? We'd yes. use the Mensivax. Yes. Uh, and, or, and, and the guidelines have been published in the Internal Medicine Journal of the Royal Australian College of Physicians. And I think they're freely available through a couple of the websites, including the haematology one. Mm -hmm. So we'll, um, put those, uh, we'll put those links onto our website. Great. In terms of antibiotics, some people say that you should then go on prophylactic penicillin for life. Mm -hmm. um, I don't agree with that. And my personal approach is to make sure that patients understand the risk that they have and tell them if they get a sore throat or an infection with a fever, you know, a gardening cut that turns bad, get on antibiotics very quickly. Yeah. And make sure that most of the time they have a prescription in the house that they can fill quickly if need be. Is there any predictor that would say this patient is more at risk of getting ITP? No. No? No, we still don't really know the cause. Uh, ITP in kids seems to be much more benign and much more likely to self-limit than in adults. Uh, the prognosis in adults is incredibly variable mm -hmm. and we've got no way of predicting who's going to relapse or not. Splenectomy is effective in relapse patients um, in my experience, in about a half to two thirds of patients, maybe three quarters, but yeah. certainly not all. And in those where it fails, we think that the liver goes on to do what the spleen used to do in terms of taking over the recycling And do those patients cells. end up then on long-term steroids? We avoid long-term steroids. And in fact, the, the treatment algorithm is kind of changing at the moment worldwide. So steroids first up, first line. Mm -hmm. Very quickly these days, we'll go to infusions of stuff called rituximab which is a much more elegant way of turning off antibody production, much yeah, less side kind effects. Some of anti-TNF? It's an anti-B cell antibody. Yeah. Um, it's specifically against CD20, which is a pan B cell antigen. It's present on B cells at a whole lot of stages of development. And um, giving it to patients where there's, for whatever reason, a troublesome antibody, whether it's against platelets, ITP, against red cells, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, um, and some other autoimmune disorders, yeah. uh, you can much more cleanly, if you like, turn off antibody production without all of the steroid side effects. Uh, I think steroids are terrible things to take. And, and my own ITP patients, I'll start with a milligram per kilogram, and that's what I advise over the phone for a patient yeah. in the country. Um, but only go at that kind of dose for about a week and then tail it down to zero, probably by dropping from 75, for example, to 50 for a week, then 25 for a week, and then down by five a week uh, from there. It can often get quite urgent. I have vivid memories of being rung up by a haematology lab at, I think, 4 a.m. to tell me that they'd just done my patient's blood count and their platelet count was two. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. Would I, would I have we, we been wouldn't... better advised to ring her up at home at half past four in the morning and say, here, quick, take these steroids? Um... Depending on where she was, we would I'll generally try say, try and contact them and get to hospital straight away. Um, most people, of course, don't have steroids lying around at home and so can't start them at home, but it is an urgent situation. And to see somebody's had, for example, an intracranial bleed from RTP is pretty catastrophic. Um, and I'd also encourage people not to forget what I rather pompously call Josky's Law, Yep. which is to look at the other blood counts because if, if you have, for example, a 16-year-old girl yep. and the platelet count is two yep. and the haemoglobin white cells are normal, then it's probably ITP. But if the haemoglobin's 90 and the white cells are one, then it's probably something much more sinister. 
So Joski's law says that the more of the three blood cell lines that are numerically low, the more likely it is to be a primary marrow disorder rather than peripheral consumption. There are new treatments coming through. So we go from prednisolone, we can give gamma globulin, which has a temporary six week long effect yep. from one infusion in many patients. You can't keep giving that forever and so, and it's an expensive and precious resource. So we've generally go from prednisolone to rituximab to splenectomy. And now just arrived on the scene is a new drug called um, Romiplostum, which is um, a, a platelet uh, receptor analog, which is the platelet equivalent of EPO. Uh, there were clinical trials of similar medications a few years back that failed because they caused ITP. They mm -hmm. generated antibodies that cross-reacted with platelets. But the new drug, uh, this one looks like a winner and we're just starting to introduce it in my department in a few patients now. Could you talk about myelomas for a little while? Myeloma is really important to diagnose because a lot of the complications can be avoided if it's picked up early enough and because obviously if it's not picked up, it's fatal on its own. Um, it's an insidious disorder yeah. and it creeps up on people and and a lot of patients will start making allowances for their reduced exercise tolerance or their symptoms because it's happened over time and yet their partner will say, hang on, you're not mowing the lawn anymore or you're not swimming your 20 laps, what's wrong? Um, the, the classic presenting features are the, summarised by the acronym CRAB, uh, calcium up, renal failure, anemia or bone pain. Um, and the bone pain is, is classic, if you like, malignant bone pain where it's worse at night, it's got a constant um, uh, nagging kind of quality unless, of course, it's complicated by a fracture. Um, so crab are the classic yeah. four kind of features, but more and more we would like to see patients diagnosed before it gets to that stage. Mm. Um, so, you know, a patient of mine recently who actually... Um, went public about it in the papers to his credit, had, was fobbed off with rib arthritis, had quite severe rib pain for two or three weeks, um, which then spontaneously got better. And so having sought advice and been told it was this rib arthritis, he left it um, and then uh, presented to another GP uh, who did a round of bloods. So Haemoglobin was 90, the creatinine was 200, mm -hmm. calcium was 4.2, very sick. So, um, yeah, if, if bone pain seems to be worsening um, rather than just fluctuating, then that's uh, one of the indications for going further. Yeah. Do you get any indicators on the blood count? The classic one is anemia with a slight macrocytosis, means a yep. volume of 105 femtolitres. Um, I have vague memories of somebody saying something about a blue background on the blood, blood film. Very true. And, and you can pull a party trick as a consultant where you come into the registrar's room and look at the slide trays of the blood films for the day and say, oh, that patient's got myeloma because you can see the blue protein staining up in mm -hmm. the background. So blue protein, RULO, which corresponds to a high SR. Um, occasionally you might actually see the plasma cells in the bloodstream. That's an ominous mm -hmm. development if it happens. There are rare presentations of myeloma. I've seen it present in a patient from Esperance who was referred just with isolated neutropenia uh, with a bit of reluctance. I did the bone marrow biopsy and there was myeloma, to my surprise. I've seen it present as a PUO, can cause fever. Um, and I've seen it present just with splenomegaly as well. But those are rare. Um, the commonest tip off is that the total protein in the blood is raised. Mm. And so if you get what's called a, a protein gap between the albumin and the total protein, uh, getting beyond 35, I think it is, for the gamma globulins, then, that might then do flare. the protein electrophoresis. Yeah. But about 20% of patients with myeloma produce just light chains. Mm -hmm. so, so the hallmark of myeloma is this B cell, plasma cell population. They're called plasma cells because they make a protein that appears in the plasma. Yeah. And... Um, about 60% of patients with myeloma, it's an IgG paraprotein, about 20% IgA, um, and the other 20% just make light chains. So we think those patients have slightly more primitive cells that can't quite get themselves to making a full-blown immunoglobulin molecule. Yep. Uh, in the old days, you would have to do a urine electrophoresis to pick up the light chains. It's a much smaller molecule, it spills in the kidneys, 
out of the bloodstream into the urine straight away, and so it doesn't show on a quip. So they um, were the ones that were the urine Bentz Jones proteins that we used to look for. Yeah, we don't need to look for that anymore. No, we have a new test now, uh, certainly at Pathwest and in most labs around Australia, called the serum free light chain assay, which mm -hmm. will detect kappa and lambda light chains elevated in small amounts. So whereas a quip is proteins in grams per litre, the serum free light chain is in milligrams per litre. And if you asked for a quip, would they automatically do that or would you have no. to suspiciously ask for both? You've got to ask for both, yeah. And the other thing about Benji Jones protein is that it doesn't usually show up on a protein dipstick. Yeah. Uh, so you need to do the blood test to screen. A skeletal survey is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, Myeloma might not be advanced enough to cause the lytic lesions, but if they are there, a skeletal survey is more sensitive, in fact, than a bone scan. Once you've got a patient with a diagnosed um, myeloma, do they have to be treated in Perth? Is this something that can be treated in a country? Uh, I'm on record at haematology conferences saying that anybody who thinks they know how to treat myeloma at the moment is kidding themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is that in the last five or so years in particular, but also the last 10 years, there have been three or four new drugs um, discovered that are very active against myeloma. And we're currently in this process worldwide of trying to work out how do we use the established old treatments plus bring in the new treatments to get the best possible effect. Yep. Uh, so, for example, in my department we have clinical trials running uh, of a thalidomide derivative for the first time as the first line of treatment for myeloma. So it's become very complicated and there are at least six or eight different cards that you can play in the treatment. In my professional lifetime, I would judge, although we're still not sure because we haven't measured the effect yet, but the new treatments have improved the prognosis probably threefold from something like three years in the bad old days of the early 80s up to now nine or 10 years for many, many patients, and the majority should have more than five years. So those patients that we used to just have on oral melphalan and occasionally pull their calcium down with an infusion, they're likely to be on something much more complicated and tertiary hospital orientated. At they're the actually likely to be on something much more patient friendly. Mm -hmm. So I haven't prescribed oral melphalan for about three years now. Uh, at last count, I have about 30 or 40 patients under my care with myeloma. and. There, there's, there's still a role for it, and we still yeah. use melphalan intravenously for a stem cell transplant. Mm -hmm. um, again, the current trial that we've just started actually randomises patients to tablets or a transplant because yeah. we think the tablets might be as good. So it's, it's a treatment paradigm that's rapidly changing at the moment. Um, all patients should get some kind of bisphosphonate. Yep. Even the very elderly, if you don't give anything else, you can prevent the bone disease and pain. Mm -hmm. Do you need to give an aclaster infusion, for instance? Is that, is that the best way to give their bisphosphonate, or are they all right on the oral? That's side? what we do. Yep. And recent evidence presented at a conference in early June is that, in fact, Zometa might improve survival as well mm -hmm. in patients and with And we can get that on Section 100 through uh, as GPs? Yep. In the I hospital. think so, yeah. Yeah, in the hospital um, we can. Just to go back to an earlier question, you asked me, uh, really you're asking about what is the differential diagnosis of a paraprotein. Yeah. So you do a quip and you get a report back saying that there seems to be a single band. Yep. Um, there are a few pointers in the blood result that might suggest that it's more likely to be malignant versus non-malignant. The key one being what is the level of the remaining gamma globulins? Because if they're suppressed, yep. uh, below 6 to 13 is the normal range, but particularly below 3 or something, in other words, you've got a paraprotein plus hypogammaglobulinemia, then that's probably a malignant B cell clone. But a paraprotein is one of three things, pure and simple. It's either not associated with malignancy, yeah. so-called monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance, yeah. MGUS. Um, and, and paraproteins get commoner as we get older. So in the over 75s, in a big study done in Sweden, about 15% of people in that age group have small paraproteins. So those are kind of like wrinkles of the immune system. Yeah. The second possibility is that there's a lump of plasma cells somewhere in the body producing a protein. Um, and by that I mean a single lump or a plasma cytoma. Yeah. In my experience, uh, whenever there's been a plasma cytoma that's big enough to make a measurable paraprotein, it's been symptomatic. 
Um, and so it's usually pretty obvious that something's wrong. Uh, and we do the full staging test, find evidence just of one lump and irradiate it and hope to cure about half of those. OK. And those will show up on a skeletal survey? Are they always in marrow or always in bone? Yeah, pretty much. They may not be big enough to show up on a skeletal survey, but there might be significant pain that directs you to get a CAT yep. scan done of an area. And then, of course, the third one is myeloma, where there's increased numbers of clonal plasma cells scattered haphazardly and in a clonal nature through the bone marrow. Myeloma is actually really best considered as a form of leukaemia in the sense that um, lymphomas and those kinds of disorders are lumpy. There's usually a lump somewhere, usually in a lymph mm -hmm. gland, but not always. Whereas mm -hmm. the leukaemia is... is much more diffuse, yeah? Yeah, leukaemias are in the bone marrow and there isn't a recognisable lump anywhere. Um, so if, if one is suspicious of myeloma, a bone marrow needs to be done. Uh, and that kind of bone marrow is best done um, at a major centre. There's about five different tests now that we do, including chromosome analysis of the plasma cells, flow cytometry to count the plasma cells, uh, the aspirate and the trephine historical tests. So there's quite a complicated workup that's done now. David, I think that's all we've got time for tonight. Thanks very much for joining us. Pleasure. Love to talk shop. <laughs>Dr. David Josky there with Dr. Olga Ward. Finally tonight, we went to Sir Charles Gardner Hospital to find out about PET scans. Dr. Rosalind Francis from the Department of Nuclear Medicine spoke to us about the uses of PET scans and what a patient getting one should expect. Ros, welcome to the program. Thank you. What exactly is a PET scan? PET scanning is positron emission tomography. And basically we image uh, radionuclides that are uh, rich in protons. So in order to get a more stable nucleus, so this is a bit of basic physics, in order to get a more stable nucleus, they try and uh, turn into neutrons and they give off what's called a positron. And the positron's a positive electron, travels a small distance in tissue, collides with a normal electron and forms an annihilation reaction. How does that differ from say a CT or an MRI scan? And how do you get like a different image from it? Our isotopes are linked to agents such as the most common one is glucose. Mm -hmm. In general, malignancy takes up a lot more glucose than normal background tissue. So we will see areas of malignancy as hotspots. And so when the glucose is taken up into cells and these annihilation reactions occur, the photons of energy at 180 degrees are detected by the cameras and the computer system behind it makes an image. So this is a fairly typical scan for us um, and in fact this uh, request was for staging of newly diagnosed lymphoma in a patient who actually presented with shoulder pain and uh, the advantage of our scans are that you can scan the whole body. Mm -hmm. Most modern PET scanners also have a low dose CT which really helps us with working out uh, the anatomy and any relevant anatomical findings and we have the PET scanning image in three views coronal, sagittal and transaxial and here we have what's called a um, volume rendered image which is quite nice for us just to get an overall feel of what's actually happening and you can see on these volume rendered images um, the extent of disease activity which in this patient um, is obviously all these hot areas uh, in bones, lymph nodes, spleen, we can localise all these areas um, and, and we just scroll through uh, the slices which give us a good overall view of exactly where we are and if we see something we can also just click on it and the image will triangulate and show us exactly what we're looking at. It's very good for radiotherapy planning, for you know, assessing signs of disease, prognosis, response assessment. It's got a great number of uses. And there is good uptake at sites of tumour, so the areas of tumour are usually pretty clearly visualised. And you'll often find in somebody, even with a disease as gross as this, that after one or two cycles of chemotherapy on metabolic imaging, the scan can become completely normal if they've had a good response. Um, so it can be quite dramatic. Is PET scanning used for anything other than cancer imaging? It is. It's used um, for brain imaging, which can be for epilepsy. So um, we often use it in the interictal state where we look for areas of reduced metabolism to locate uh, where an epileptic focus may be coming from. So it's used in combination with other things such as MRI um, and um, other studies to try and work out ictal foci. Okay, so an MRI scan will give you uh, like a, a physical image, Correct. a picture or a model, yeah. 
and then the PET scan will give you something that will talk about the metabolic rate of the various tissues? That's right. So we generally say things like um, CT, MRI, X-ray are anatomy. Mm -hmm. and our imaging is more function. So we're looking at functional processes. We also look at um, cardiac imaging for myocardial viability. So in people who have had previous large infarcts and um, if you're not sure if there's viable myocardium, then FDG pet imaging of the heart is useful for that as well. So this is another common indication that we get, which is staging for newly diagnosed lung cancer. Yep. It's usually to assess um, whether they're suitable for surgery. Yep. And in this case, um, you can already see on this rotating image that the um, amount of disease activity is much less than that previous case that we saw. And in fact, the focus that we're looking for is uh, this one in the right lung. And again, having the CT is really very helpful, so we can immediately see where the lung mass is. Uh, we then look and see it is definitely metabolically active, so in keeping yeah. with a malignancy, because occasionally we'll be asked to assess solitary pulmonary nodules. Glucose is a very good uh, tracer for tumour, but there are other things that can cause glucose activity, and the most common one is inflammation or infection. So often when we're looking at images, we need to decide, is the activity due to malignancy, or could it be a false positive due to something such as inflammation? And this particular case is a bit of low-grade activity extending peripherally, which may in fact be just due to the peripheral lung having a bit of collapse, consolidation. Mm -hmm. um, in this particular patient, they were concerned whether there was some hyalur lymph node involvement, and there is actually a little bit of activity at that hilum, and we would be suspicious of hyalur lymph node involvement, um, but nothing on the contralateral side and nothing in the mediastinum. So that suggests that uh, they're likely to be suitable for surgery. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, we also like to look and make sure that they don't have unexpected metastases. So we'll look through the whole scan, paying particular attention to uh, liver, adrenals and uh, the bones to make sure they don't have any unexpected skeletal metastases. Currently only available in the public system at Charles Gardner? Until recently it was only available in the public system at Charles Gardner. A, a, a private um, a PET scanner has been in Perth previously at St John's and there's a new one just opened up at Hollywood. Um, there's actually limited Medicare rebates available um, and in order to be a rebatable site you need to fulfil certain Commonwealth requirements or certain Medicare requirements um, and we're also here at Sir Charles Gardner a Commonwealth site so we have a slightly greater rebate um, number of indications than um, other non-Commonwealth sites. So it's a slightly complicated issue in terms of referrals and of government rebates. It sounds like a service that must be absolutely overwhelmed with referrals. How do you prioritise all the patients? Because you're taking paediatric referrals yes. and country referrals and... Uh... We try and prioritise patients who um, you know, require urgent treatment, such as staging for primary lung cancer who may be suitable for potentially curative surgery um, or newly diagnosed lymphomas requiring urgent chemotherapy. So we will, we have a priority system based on uh, the urgent need of the case. Um, and there's actually a wide number of indications in oncology for FDG PET scanning, such as staging, prognosis, response mm -hmm. assessment, um, you know, trying to guide biopsy, radiotherapy planning. There's a, a vast number of areas where it's shown to be quite useful. Um, and we just try and do our best to prioritise based on the needs of the patient. And thanks to Dr. Francis and the team at Sir Charles Gardner for their assistance with that story. Well, that's all we have time for tonight. Again, many thanks to everyone involved in the program. And remember, if you want to review this program or any of our previous programs, you can simply visit our website at www.ruralhealthwest.com.au and you can watch the programs live or download them as video or audio podcasts. We're back again on the 7th of September with a program that will focus on immune deficiency. Thanks for taking the time to join us. I'm Jerry Gannon. Good night.